whenever we work together, Dr. Thrain has always said, you know, healthcare is important, but there's a world beyond us, and it's important for the whole country. He's a big believer that if we don't address healthcare, both as an individual as in, or as a nation, it's going to be one of the biggest roadblocks for this country. And that transcends anything else. So it's great to have Dr. Thrain telling us about how to stay healthy. Thank you, sir, and we're really honored to have you here. Thank you, and uh, my apologies for being late. I know you guys are cutting into your lunch time. I just wanted to share with you, and unfortunately it's just before lunch, so maybe it will affect you a little bit in your thinking of what to eat. But I thought it's time that, you know, we relate medicine which is out there in illness related to you guys today and just to empower you enough so that what are the basic principles of healthy living and also in case un unfortunately somebody falls sick with especially with heart disease what to do so i'll walk you through quickly okay so one of the things about heart disease is that 50 percent of all deaths in our country will be either directly with heart or the cardiovascular system that means strokes uh, the uh, paralysis stuff like that which will happen associated with with heart the rest of the diseases of course form the rest of the 50 percent but you look at it i want you to notice cancer is actually crept up hugely in the last 15 to 20 years which was you can call it not we weren't aware or the fact that the current environment is producing havoc with cancer. So, and unfortunately cancer is one of those things, if you're going to get a disease, you might as well get heart, heart disease rather than cancer because at least 99% is curable. So, the other problem that we are facing in India is that we are also the capital of diabetes. So we are, these are two distinctions, heart disease and diabetes, which we never wanted to have, but we have. And it's not a secret that why are we diabetics? Because we of our culture, our environment, and the changing habits of exercise and things like that. But <clears throat> worst of all, is that we always celebrate with huge amount of sweets. So somebody is born, somebody is engaged, somebody is uh, passed. There's that Papu Pass Ho Gaya campaign. So, you know, this, all this goes on and on in our life and even if you are, you're not really a, a sweet tooth person, you land up having a lot of sweets. So, cu couple that with the fact that you're not exercising or expanding those sugar calories that you're getting, then the, it is inevitable that diabetes will happen. So anyway, the other problems that are associated with us today and that affects you a lot is high blood pressure. Because we know that continuous stress has led to at least 30% of us either having high blood pressure or have a tendency for high blood pressure. So if you are not aware of it, it can lead to havoc later. Now, as I was talking about blood sugar or, or diabetes, actually it starts in your childhood. So if you are parenting, if you are if you have nieces, nephews, we have to really get it in our head that love and sugar have no relationship. <laughs> if you, it is actually speaking, when you are unable to communicate intelligently, you do it with sweets. So you bribe children. You will bribe them with whatever ice creams or chocolates or whatever you want to give. So please be careful that any cell, fat cell, which is put on in infancy or in early childhood will always stay with you. So even, you know, you just say, I've got a hormonal problem, you know, my family has a tendency to be put on weight. That may be so to just a small degree. Most of it is what happened to you in your childhood. So you will always carry that burden for the rest of your life. And what is scary today is that in the two years that we did the survey, we know that the prevalence of obesity is rising in India on a yearly basis. So it's not a secret that it's that junk food and all the other stuff has added hugely to our early problems. To try to reduce it into a formula, we described it as a metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome goes like this. That if your circumference of your waist in men is more than 36 inches or 102 two centimeters, 
then your chances of for every inch that you put on your chances of getting heart disease go up by 10 percent women as we have said 88 centimeters but unfortunately women don't realize when they are putting on their waists are increasing because men get feedback from their pants women get from expandable wear so you women have to be even more careful that abdominal obesity is actually directly related to heart disease second we talk about blood pressure third is about your blood sugar like i said about and then of course the lipids or the fat in your in your blood now if you have three of these positive then from five percent your chances of getting high heart disease goes up goes up to twenty percent so it's a multiplier effect so just being aware of the fact that you need to maintain your blood pressure within a range, maintain, need to maintain your waist size and your weight within a range and to make sure you don't get high blood sugar that is diabetes, you are actually protecting yourself by 50%. So what happens in heart disease? This is the picture, it's the cut section of an artery which has if you look at there is a there is a narrow there which says endothelium endothelium is the inner lining of these arteries there are thousands of miles of arteries in our body each one is lined with this smooth surface which is smoother than anything you've ever seen in your life so much so that all your life blood flows through all these arteries without sticking to the walls because as you know the blood has a very sticky component as soon as you bleed it comes out and gets in touch with the uh, with the air it starts clotting that's how you save your life so this smooth smooth service along with the fact that there is a velocity in your blood flowing prevents blood from sticking to these walls and hopefully it will go on forever but when you start getting high blood uh, levels of fat which is lipids we call it cholesterol there are many fractions of cholesterol then we can see that there are blobs of fat which leak through these capillaries somewhere is a uh, this is the pointer okay all right so what I, what I wanted to show you was that these are the blobs of fat and we call them LDL low density lipoproteins they are so small that they can actually leak through the endothelium and start collecting under the inner lining of the of the artery and then over a period of time if your blood 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 cholesterol stays high this blob becomes bigger and bigger till it breaks the inner lining one day and the blood clots on it because any rough surface means that the blood will stick to it and form and that's what we call a myocardial infarction heart attack coronary thrombosis whatever you may call it what all it means is that the person will get a heart attack because that muscle which was supplied by this artery will not get its oxygen supply and over a period of time will die now what are the reasons that contribute and we divide it into three one is the top two that's family history age and sex these two you have no control over so family history is very important because if one of your parents or one side of your parents family has heart disease then it raises your chances of getting heart disease by 25 percent if both parents have heart disease in the family then you have you, the chance goes up 50 percent so just the fact that it should be in the back of your mind if somebody in your family has had heart disease what of course it's a risk factor but it also means that you can reverse it so if we know that and i i'll recommend i'll tell you what we recommend later that this is the group that we call the high group high risk group you and we need to treat them differently than the rest of the population then comes age and sex age of course as you get older the chances of getting heart disease become more but sex has a huge uh, relevance to this women are protected from heart disease till the age of 50 so very few women will get in in fact the ratio of men to women getting heart disease is nine to one but as soon as because there is something with estrogen which is the uh, hormone which uh, females have but diminishes after menopause that that shield disappears starts disappearing so between the age of 50 and 65 women start catching up with men <clears throat> and by the time women reach 65 men and women will have the same chance of getting a heart, heart disease 
So this is another factor which I want you to keep in the back of your mind. Then you take, go to the right hand side for risk factors, lipoprotein little a or you can say all four of them are tendencies which are a biochemical deficiencies which you are born with or you have developed over a period of time. So you say lipoprotein little a is a protective enzyme which if it's high in some people can lead to heart disease. NIDDM is just a fancy form for diabetes and blood diabetes as I told you is contributing hugely to heart disease. So diabetes starts creeping on to you by after the age of 20, 25. <laughs> unless you, there, are, there is a very small group which has juvenile diabetes which develops from, very, from early childhood. So the earliest signs of diabetes come in your blood. By 2025, we can start telling whether somebody has, is, a, is at risk of developing diabetes. Then comes high blood pressure, that's hypertension, as I told you. That that's one thing that this current generation or current working people have to be used to because stress C continuous stress actually contributes hugely to hypertension. Then we get the high cholesterol and the LDL, these are all fractions of, of uh, fat in your, in your blood. So these four are the ones that you are born with but they are all controllable. So if you are aware of the fact that you have any one of these, you can actually bring your risk factor back to normal. Normal being that if you had no risk factors today in India, you would still have a 5% chance of developing cardiovascular disease no matter what your genealogy is, what your, what your genes are like, what your diet is like, what your exercise. But when you start losing ground with one, any of these fact, uh, risk factors, they start multiplying. So by the time you have four of them, the chances of getting heart disease is 35 to 40%. So that's why you also need to be aware that when we go to the left side, these are self-added risk factors. So tobacco in, in any form, whether it's chewing or whether smoking, will have, or even now we have those nicorettes in, uh, and the sprays of nicorette, tobacco, nicotine in any form will have the same effect. What it does is it produces spasm of the arteries throughout your body. And that's where repeated exposure to that can cause damage to the inner lining which I showed you, the intima, and once you can inflict damage on that, then you have set up this, the vicious cycle of uh, the uh, fat leaking under the endothelium and these blobs developing inside your arteries and ultimately causing a heart attack one day. The second I told you is obesity. So we say, and it's very easy to find out your ideal body weight, which is height and age. These are charts that are available. If you stay within 10% 10 10 minus plus of your ideal body weight, you will be okay. In the sense, the best you can do for yourself. If the moment you start creeping above 10%, that's when you start increasing your, for every 10%, you'll increase your chance by 5%. So there is very, now we have mathematical prediction for a, for a given individual to say, what is your risk factor of developing heart disease? Then we have stress. Stress, till today I used to say, stress is something which we all have. And stress is something which we need to bust regularly because you can't escape stress. In fact, one of my surgeons called me this morning who had been up all night. He says, I think longevity comes from stress because I feel <laughs> he says the more stressed I'm feeling, the better I'm feeling. So point being that stress per se is inescapable, may not be bad, may be actually stimulating you to do things which, which are fantastic, but at the same time, there are ways and means of baking stress and we'll talk about it later. So coronary artery disease, unfortunately, has, is now appearing in somebody. So it presents itself in three forms. One is asymptomatic. Asymptomatic means you don't know anything about it. And we, as we recommend that you should get a complete screening done between the age of 25 to 30, latest by 30. That's when we will do your profiling for your risk factors. So you don't know, but we know from your tests that you are developing blockages in your arteries. That is the best way of finding out because at that, at that stage, we can actually reverse heart disease. We, the reversal of heart disease success rate is very high now. And it's, it's not, so, not so difficult to, uh, to achieve. Second is that 
a person has developed it to a level where the blockages have reached 60, 70, 80 percent in the arteries. So you start getting symptoms, which we call angina. Symptoms is angina basically is a Greek word for cry of the heart. Now what you're saying that when the blood doesn't reach there in, in good quantities or as much as is needed by the heart muscle, because the heart muscle is a machine, it works like an engine 24 seven. It's never rests. That's the, the amazing part of, of the heart. So that muscle, if it's not getting enough blood, it gets lactic acid accumulated in the muscle and that causes pain, except in di chronic diabetics. Diabetes kills the nerve endings of the heart. So you will not feel pain as your first symptom. So diabetics have to be doubly cautious. That's why we put them in the high risk group. So if one is feeling chest pain, choking repeatedly after doing a physical activity or an, an emotional turmoil and it stops after stopping that physical activity or disengaging, then you should suspect that it is coming from your heart and could be uh, beginning of blockages that are getting serious. So this is another stage where if we catch it at the angina stage, we can still do uh, that, make that person live a normal life 99% of the time. But the worst way to find out is that you don't know that you have heart disease and the only first symptom you get is a heart attack. So heart attack is dangerous. Why? Because 20% of the people who get a heart attack will die. 10% before they reach the hospital and 10% in the first year after they reach the hospital. So there's a huge price to pay. If one is aware, and that's the reason why I'm here, is that if you are aware and you are actually living life a little carefully, then 99% of the people, even if they develop coronary artery disease, if they are caught in time, can lead a normal life what they would have left, uh, lived otherwise. On the other hand, if you ignore the symptoms or your, uh, your regular checks, you could land up with a heart attack, which can, of course, cost your life at least 20% of the time. <coughs> Excuse me. Then this I wanted to show you, one, two, because there's a lot of confusion, and this is part of it is how to protect yourself from doctors. So what are the treatments? You know, hopefully none of you will get it, but you may have a neighbor or a family member. It's inevitable somebody will get it. So when we do see somebody who we think has developed coronary artery disease to the level where it's become dangerous, we will rec recommend an angiogram. The angiogram can show one of four things. So the first picture shows that there are some irregularities in the dye which is flowing through the arteries. And at this stage, we want to catch it. If somebody is going to get coronary artery disease, this is the stage where we'd like to catch it because it is imminently 90% of the time controllable at this stage. Then, unfortunately, it has progressed to a blockage. I don't know how many of you can see it, but this is a critical blockage in one artery, which is short. And this is very easily treated by angioplasty. And I'll show you what, what angioplasty means. Whereas if it becomes multiple and the blockages become long and are in the beginning of arteries, then they are not suitable for stenting, then we do bypass and we will show you some of those also. And then this was the group which was the no option group. That is the, bl the blockages have reached a stage where we can't do angioplasties, where we can't do surgery. But now there is new hope for this group also. So the the second picture that I showed you was of that, that this is blockage can be treated by angioplasty. And the angioplasty is basically a catheter that we'll, we will put across from the groin or in the, from the wrist across the blockage. Now if we to take this fat deposit as the plaque, we call it plaque, we put this wire across it. On the wire there is a balloon and a, and a metal stent, sc scaffolding. So when you blow the balloon, the balloon will put this, compress the fat and this scaffolding that we have, metal scaffolding, which we call stent, will be left behind so that it keeps the artery open. The good and the bad of the stent is that this is a, a minimally invasive procedure. You do enter the body, but you don't have to cut it open and things like that. And there in 
short blockages which are not so long and not not so many in a in a given point because each stent will have a 10 15 percent chance of closing again this tissue starts growing in inside the stent again so that's the limitation that's why we say people who are non diabetic have one or two blockages which are not of great length and are in the middle of the artery are the most ideal for stenting patients who have multiple blockages long blockages people who that are in the beginning of the arteries and diabetics are not suitable for stenting so that's one little information you should keep in the back of your mind then comes the third option is the bypass option and what used to happen in the early days when we started bypass surgery we used to have patients with long scars in the middle of the chest we used to use the heart lung machine and they used to take six to eight weeks to recover properly now what we've done since 1995 is we we progressively transitioned to using beating heart without using the heart lung machine and if you can appreciate that in the back the heart is beating actually but the area where we are doing the bypass is absolutely stable so technology came to our rescue we have stabilizers which will permit us not to stop the heart not to use the heart lung machine which is an external risk factor and then still we can do the whole operation through smaller incision so the incision size has become half the heart lung machine not being there has made the recovery period to three weeks so there is and and the trauma to the body is absolutely half that's why so then we have developed many techniques that we don't even cut open the breastbone we go through in between the ribs and do the full bypass and these are three guys who happen to be here together which we took a picture of but more importantly even in the valves we now do through port access two inches incision under the right breast and you the, then we have transitioned to robotics so since 1995 there has been a huge movement forward in trying to minimize the trauma of or surgery on the body so now we can do the full operation robotically this you'll see my picture sitting on the on the console so the surgeon actually operates on the console and this is 3d 10, 10 times magnification that you can see with the with the 3d cameras that are put inside the body and each command of the surgeon is translated from every one centimeter movement of the hand is translated to one millimeter inside the body so these are this is the con remote command so it, actually the surgeon is performing the surgery as you can see my hands moving there and doing all the movements but this is being remotely remotely means it's in the same room but but a couple of meters away that these pencil like instruments which we insert uh, in, into the body through five millimeter holes will actually follow the command very precisely and convert it from one centimeter to one millimeter movement so that it increases the precision also now you'll see on the screen here how these instruments follow the command of the surgeon so you are actually able to mobilize the arteries uh, without any blood loss and there are very delicate instruments like you know the the tips are like pin pin points and then you can and this is the like I, I told you about the beating heart you can do the whole operation with without opening the chest so without wasting too much time now you can just see the steadiness of the whole thing so it's not so the whole uh, the whole anastomosis can be com completed within 15 to 20 minutes and the patient I'll just show you what they go home with so this has cut down the recovery period so you see that this is I think I, I'll just go to, so now instead of that incision in the chest the patient can go home with four little holes like this and they go home 48 hours later instead of seven days later or eight days later so this is these are the advantages of technology which has come done many new things so to make it possible for us to to do things with minimum trauma and minimum pain now i've told you about the fourth picture where is the picture of no option patients whose arteries had been so badly damaged that nothing could be done so you see there are no arteries or if this artery is there it's got so many blockages that you can't do anything to it these patients we started doing stem cell therapies so we take autologous stem cells we we just finished a study where we take it from the uh, from the bone marrow of the patient itself process it and then inject it retrograde into the heart this is a special technique 
and you will see with the laser and the stem cells we can create new channels so you'll see this this picture here that channel and then the stem cells go into this so there are many techniques we have used with with stem cells but the interesting part is that we have now been able to improve the heart function the study is now one year old with the last patients will finish the study by by another month or so but the initial part is that 50 percent of the patients have huge recovery of their heart function in the first six months their walking distance doubles triples but then they start showing signs of weakness again the other 50 percent are going close to one year now we'll see what happens but that means that these cells are actually able to regenerate heart muscle activity their life may be limited we may need to redose them but it has opened a whole new vista for patients who have heart failure which is a big big problem in the in our country or around the world that this may be the new hope so coming back to you these are all statistics that just show that okay if we were if i have convinced you halfway that i will it will change to that you can reduce the risk of heart disease in yourself by early detection by at least 60 to 70 percent there are many studies to show that now what do we do if a person comes to us how do we tell how what is the risk and whether the arteries of the heart are getting thick and 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 susceptible to fat leaking through them so we found that there are carotid arteries which go to the brain and if you measure the intima the endothelium thickness of a carotid artery you can tell whether the patient has a tendency to develop atherosclerosis or not atherosclerosis being the fancy name for deposition of fat inside your arteries so if we regularly monitor them yearly we can tell who are the people who are actually progressing who we don't these are the earliest signs you can pick up right the second thing that we do with the high risk group today is to use what we call CT, CT scan so cardiac CT scan which is now based on a 256 slice CT it used to be 64 slice CT but the problem with that was that it was giving too much radiation for a preventive check we did not it was not justifiable but with 256 there is virtually no radiation so you can actually inject a dye in the vein and take the picture within five minutes and you know whether somebody is developing blockages or not so today the high risk group that is the group which has which, uh, which has family history diabetics hypertension those are the guys who should be screened in any case around 30 35 years of age to see whether there are any signs of atherosclerosis we can find the rest of the population does not need a need a ct scan we we have other tests to actually screen them but if ever this this question may, uh, arises in the mind that are you getting chest pain are you getting angina or or any other unsettling features then ct scan is the way to go because that will tell you black and white whether you have a, you should have anxiety over what you are experiencing or not because especially in women in the old days we used to do test after test after test on women and ultimately landed up with ang angiography with putting the catheter in the body we don't have to do that anymore so this has become a very valuable screening device and this is the kind of pictures that you get so you can tell whether there are any blockages developing or not so coming back again so this is the no that means that angiography is necessary when you have severe doubt so when will it happen it used to happen to everybody if your stress test was positive if your thallium scan was positive or you had angina we don't need to do it now because there is ct scan in the middle but if your ct scan shows that there are blockages because ct scan will tell you whether there are blockages but will not, not tell you exactly how critical they are so in the case of doubt then you'll have to go to angiography which is we put a catheter and inject the dye directly into the artery that is why we called it the gold standard that ultimately is the gold standard so lifestyle modification so diet this we call the inverted pyramid things you like the most you have the least so fried food sugar is the least second comes dairy products dairy products are rich in fat 
so they should be limited for especially for people who are have a tendency for high cholesterol and have uh, have family history of heart disease and things like that so there are there are ways of doing it you can take uh, you know the skim milk and 2% fat milk 1% fat milk you could do many things but just be aware of the fact that milk and milk products have a very high content of fat in its original form so in india they, there is a belief that gai ka doodh is better than bhais ka doodh so when you say patient doodh pita ha ji gai ka pita hu but doesn't mean that it doesn't have fat it's just that in your mind you have developed that it is better than than bhais that is true okay so second thing is as i said milk and dairy products so they are the second most frequent things you need to eat vegetables fruits obviously are the best because they have high fiber the sugar is complex sugar it does not give you diabetes as often as white refined sugar does and then comes carbohydrates the carbohydrates is something to to learn that uh, maida is the worst and mixed grain is the best so you you know about misi roti and this that these so we have many ways of mixing grain mixing grain is very healthy so whenever possible that's what you need to do but naan and kulchas are the worst <laughs> so, i told you so the rule is the simple no pasta itself is still complex because it got some egg and uh, some other stuff put in so it becomes it doesn't get absorbed right away right so so but you don't have to remember all this you just say do i like it yeah i love it but then uh, that means i can't eat it <laughs> right but see what happens you know it is a very difficult cultural challenge because of the fact that like we said we celebrate and then we not only celebrate but we also st state our stature in society through food so the bigger the table in a wedding the bigger is your stature the more you you showed that you are actually well to do so if you start from left to right you'll see everything is floating in in oil and then the end of it you will see jalebi rabdi kulfi and gulab jamun all four over there so that does not mean that we should eat all four of them just because they are being offered because don't forget there will be another wedding tomorrow day after it's a, it's a continuous affair it's not that it's going to be once in a lifetime which happens in europe of course because in a, in a lifetime they attend an average of five weddings we attend five in a week so so that's why it is important that you in eat intelligently so nothing wrong with eating a jalebi or two there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with eating half or or, or a full gulab jamun you you guys are young so you can take much more but you must not get obsessed with you know the kulfi and rabdi together i mean it's lethal i mean then you shouldn't blame us okay then we have exercise and that's i want you to show you one what is glycemic index so there is a two parts of sh of sugar one is the glycemic index the other is the glycemic load so if you take something and and it is a lot related to fruits so if you have a fruit which gets absorbed very quickly then the glycemic index is very high that means you'll get a peak very quickly of that and then it'll come down whereas the, the glycemic load may not be much now if you you know we always have been saying an apple is a good apple a day right apple by itself has got a very low glycemic load but it has a very high glycemic index the moment you eat it your blood sugar goes up so you have to the, so the rule is one fruits whose skin you can eat are better than fruits whose skin you cannot eat question mark comes of an orange an orange you still eat the skin as marmalade or whatever you know preparation you can put it in in 100 things so you can eat the skin but mango skin you don't eat mango is probably the rich, the best tasting but the worst health index because it has 500 calories per mango any decent size mango <laughs> so that's why so that's why you need to and i mean that's god's blessing on india we have the best mangoes in the world but they are lethal now how do you 
there, I'm sorry? Papaya is good, but very high glycemic index. So what you do is, no, there's a way of neutralizing glycemic index. And the way to do it is to eat it with nuts. Because nuts have protein which will slow down the absorption of sugar. So one, your load will be less, and two, your spike will be less. So if you're going to eat a bowl of papaya, and you take one fistful of almonds, or pistachio, or walnuts, not cashews, <laughs> really. And so, actually walnuts are the best, but you can't eat too much of them because they give you blisters, they're too, too rough on the, on the mouth. So you can, but you can't eat too much of, but walnut a day is fantastic. So pistachio is, and, and almonds are ex excellent, but what will fit into your fist? That's the important. So you'll see, you, uh, you just throw in a few almonds into your bowl, a bowl of fruit or whatever you're eating, just pop a few in the mouth, you would have helped yourself. Okay. So, so much for a glycemic index. Then, okay, now your weight loss. It's, uh, it's common sense. Slow weight loss is always better than, you know, crash diets because they will only come back with a vengeance. And they do take a toll on your body also because when you go on crash diets, you get into a catabolic state. Then all the lactic acid gets accumulated in your body and that damages the cells, kidney cells and things like that. So you do it 50 times in your life, then you'll be without kidneys. So, so that, there, will, that there is a price to pay. So anybody wants to talk about alcohol? You sure? <laughs> Young people wanting to know about alcohol I'm, is a little paradox. But to what we say is for liquor, do you want to drown my voice out? By <laughs> so we are saying two drinks. That means small drinks, 30 milliliters, that means maximum of 60 milliliters a day, four times a week, has been proven not to damage you. Okay. Doesn't mean if you don't drink you have to, but the fact is it doesn't damage you. <laughs> but the other fact to know is that if you have skipped three days, does not mean you can add them all up on a Saturday. <laughs> so these are the two things. So then you can calculate because also one of the bad parts about alcohol is it's very rich in calories. So there are three calories per cc. So if you have 60 cc, that means you have had almost 200 calories and then it makes you hungry. So whatever else you add on. So you just be aware of it. I am not a Puritan. You calibrate yourself. <laughs> Nuts I told you and physical activity. Okay. So what we are saying is the for cardiovascular activity or, or conditioning, we pr pr uh, recommend 45 minutes of exercise at least three to four times a week. And the way to do it, if you want to do it cardiac friendly, is to use the first three minutes to actually ramp up the speed. The minimum you must achieve is one and a half times your resting heart rate. So average resting heart rate is between 75 and 80. So you need to achieve in the first two, three minutes, 120. You maintain that for 30, 35 minutes and then let it cool down. Now that's for one baseline exercise. So if you can do four kilometers in 45 minutes, you're at a good clip. So jogging is can be done, but hard jogging will hurt your joints eventually. So it adjusted for age, you can jog. But the best exercise is a jog. That is, if you walked any faster, you'll be jogging. So that's how fast you need to walk. The other thing is to say, for people who really want to, when you do this 45 minute plateau, which I'm talking about, then your, the metabolic rate of your body will stay up for the first half an hour to 45 minutes, and then it'll come down to normal. But if you want to actually extend the metabolic rate from, from going up to six to eight hours, you need to do interval training. That means every four minutes, you increase your heart rate by another 15%. So if you're 120, you go to 135, 140. 
come down 120 four minutes then again for a minute 135 again so in your 45 minutes you have done four spikes and just by doing those four spikes you will find that your metabolic rate will stay up that means you can you will it's prevent you from putting on weight or you'll get much more bang for your for your exercise than you would otherwise so smoking I told you about stress okay now, like I said, we can't escape it. This is, by the way, is a picture of me, some one of my patients made. So, there is a 24 hour limit. That means if you're highly stressed, you must break your stress every 24 hours. Otherwise, you, were, uh, you could be a victim of any one of these things that are on the board. I don't know how many of you can read it, but heart attacks, high blood pressure, peptic ulcer, irritable bowel syndrome, tension, headaches, depression, back, backache, all these things can happen with st uninterrupted stress. So the way to break stress and the way we do it, I mean, it's a simple yoga is uh, much talked about, but it really works. So whether it is yoga or whether it is regular breaks, but when we say breaks, it does not mean alcoholic binge on Saturday night is a break. <laughs> that does not get rid of stress, although it makes you feel good, but doesn't, doesn't break stress. So if you can do yoga at least three times a week, you will find and learn the breathing exercises. If you can learn the breathing exercises, any time you have any stress that you feel or you are you're pissed off with somebody or your boss yelled at you or whatever happened, just two minutes of Vipassana will bring you right back to where you want to be. So it's, there is a huge dividend in learning yoga and the breathing exercise are very simple but highly recommended. And then of course sports are always de-stressing and then it just as a wind up take home message would be that eating, activity, smoke free, limited alcohol and maintaining 10% of your body weight, ideal body weight is the best you can do for yourself. Then the rest, okay. Is it, is it okay to replace uh, uh, walking by yoga? I mean, no, no, okay. I'm glad you asked that question. Yoga is, unless you're doing intense power yoga. Yoga is not exercise. It is basically a exercise of your internal organs. It keeps your ligaments stretched. It prevents aging. It does many, many good things to you, but does not do cardiovascular unless you're doing 50 Surya Namaskars and things like that, which, which you can, but not. Shopping is not exercise. <laughs> because you know, if, it, if that was exercise, no woman would ever get any problem or no woman, no woman would get fat. But because that is stop and go, stop and go. That's why golf is not an exercise. I mean, 90% uh, of us like to believe it is, but it's not. Because of the fact that you are never sustained for long period at that level that I, uh, that I was talking about. So that's why. So now, I'll take this opportunity of and Rana and we are doing some PWC and we are doing some work together on how where to take India as a healthcare or as a country. So my own obsession I'll share with you is the fact that why is India it used to be developing country underdeveloped sorry then developing then almost developed now it's emerging market it's never called India. So I was giving a lecture in Washington and I said, I said, we don't say drowning USA, you're drowning today, but this was in 2008. But why is India called? Because of the fact that we have in our life, short life, 65 years is long but short also as a country's life. We have mastered and prided ourselves of being master copycats. We say, you do it and we'll learn from you and then we will bring it here and we'll reverse engineer it or put, put it on. So I don't know. What we are doing today is good for India or not good for India, even in healthcare. So we go, we, I'm a, I've learned the most there is to learn in, 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 medicine, in modern medicine, but we know modern medicine has three ways. It's very effective. It is maximally invasive in the sense I just showed you how we cut open bodies. 
then it we give poisons which is antibiotics or chemotherapy or we take the most powerful radiation beam and you shoot it shoot the cancer cells doing collateral damage this all we know effective but hugely expensive so if we went on this path of being very happy being copycats that means we will never be able to treat 90% of our population and it's not only ours there are 5 billion people out there who are like us so this my whole mental state was that look the difference between medicine between united states and india is that there are institutions like harvard mayo cleveland clinic johns hopkins stanford which are not only the highest end of care but also fountain heads of all new knowledge and with the acute awareness of genomics to say gene pools react differently to different things that we are just copycatting we are not actually looking at our own population and see what do they need so with that and many people ask me when i was thrown out of escorts why did you start medanta to begin with you were doing a great job there so i felt that india must go to the next step that we must have institutions like harvard mayo cleveland in india so that's the endeavor with which i started medanta which we call the institute for integrated health sciences in early days we bought 43 acres made a city out of it this 2010 we opened it in january and what we did over there was that we wanted to one bring the best of kind on the same platform which fortunately happened across all super specialties we have the masters who had to have three qualities one that they were masters in their field compared to the best in the world so it's benchmarked inter internationally two they must have reached a stage in their life when they can look beyond themselves not only keep you know doing surgeries or treatments and all that just for to make money themselves but to be able to teach and share the knowledge and the third was that they must have impeccable ethics even if they were doing dirty things before they must be happy not to do them at medanta and we were fortunate enough to find very very good people and then we put it together with the highest technology you can find anywhere in the world so if you see the good door, go down the list i don't think there are more than 10 institutions which have everything that i have listed here in the world then the third thing what you did was provide them the combined platform so that we don't work unilaterally anymore we always work in groups so if heart disease is to be looked at or obesity is to be looked at or any disease is to be like diabetes cancer whatever it may be we choose the people who in this group who will contribute to collective thinking so that new methodologies can be developed which are more favorable to our country which is more relevant to our people and hopefully half the cost in coming years so that's the effort which was and in that like i just give you the example of a cancer institute cancer institute you know you normally will have two three cancer specialists we have a cancer specialist in every small part of cancer part of the body that you can find and they will sit together and find a solution for the patient and do start research so that to say what should we be doing for our genetic pool so that's the process that we started 3 years ago we even have things like cyber knife which is now which, which costs about 8 million dollars but there are only 3 4 uh, in in all of asia so there are many many things we have done as i talk talk to you about robotics today we do take out prostates do heart surgery gynecology uh, pancreatic surgery ent surgery all with robotics so this has brought us to a stage where we have now started developing the new robots we are now working on technology ourselves to say can we produce a robot which is 1/10 the cost we are working on equipment which would be 1/10 the cost so a liver transplant all these things that we are doing i just wanted to share with you and the whole thing is that most importantly we started research with ayurveda because there is a, a, a strong belief in my mind that the reason why ayurveda and chinese traditional medicine they are both based in herbal medicine because they left kept the world alive for 5000 years but then they got beaten because they did not have scientific documentation of their methodologies or their ingredients or their active active products so if we put them through the whole paces of of uh, science the way we we uh, do drug discovery in modern medicine we may be able to find things which are 
combined therapies or singular therapies of Ayurveda which are as effective, less invasive and maybe half or one third the cost. So that's the endeavor. It may not happen in my lifetime but I'm hoping that this thing will continue and we have done alliances around the world for that. So we have alliances and, and we have done a lot of good work. This is just technology pictures. And we have done enough work that Parkinson's now we can treat with Ayurveda along with modern medicine drugs by reducing the dose of L-Dopa to half and improving mobility by double. So it's already working the whole idea, but it's still a long journey. But that's what I wanted you guys to be inspired about, that that's where India is to be taken, <laughs> not to think that we are so good that we learned everything from the West and we continue to do it in India only for the first 20% of our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope all of you are feeling healthy. So with permission, we take a few questions. So first, let me rewind back to the symptoms. Why in India we have a double challenge is because our diet is rich in spices. So many a times when you are getting symptoms of heart attack means either burning or constriction, you may think it is, it is indigestion, acidity. It's a very common thing to happen also in our diet, right? So for acidity, what do you normally do? Whether you, you take an antacid, whether you take pudina hara or you do whatever your, your grandmother recipe is. If it doesn't work in the first 10 minutes, because acidity should work, then you start worrying about whether it's a heart attack. Okay. If that is persistent, you will then do two things. One, you can take aspirin, dissolve it in a glass of water. That is the real aspirin, what we call disprin. That's 300 milligrams of, not the little one. If they are little ones, put two, three of them in the water and you give it to the person or take it yourself whichever because that what 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 aspirin does uh, immediately on on dissolution into the blood is that it prevents the platelets which are the sticky part of the blood from aggregating together so it reduces their stickiness so hopefully you can limit the size of the heart attack that clots don't become bigger okay then of course you need to take them to the closest facility Closeness means that, you see, today there are two treatments of heart attack. One thing you need to know is that the maximum damage of a heart attack or a muscle death is in the first 60 minutes of a heart attack. If you can reverse blood supply or restore blood supply to that part of the heart muscle within the first 60 minutes, you can salvage most of the damage. So that's why we say the golden hour. So rush them to the nearest hospital, which can at least give them what we call clot-busting medicine, which is streptokinase, which most nursing homes, most small hospitals can even do. But if you're closer to a larger hospital, then what we do is that we will take them to the, and if, if the ECG is showing that they're actually in the middle of a heart attack, we'll take them to the cath lab, do an angiography and open the artery right away, which we call rescue angioplasty. So if, a, if a, a hospital of good quality is available in the vicinity, go to that. If not, then at least go to a nursing home where streptokinase can be given because at least 80% of the relief can be gotten from that. Okay, now somebody collapses in front of you, right? That's where a what we call CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation comes very handy. And actually, we had done a lot of work in Delhi Well, I was at Escorts Heart Institute. We haven't started really in seriousness here yet because we were training our own 4,000 people who work for us. But we are ready to do it. I don't know if you have already started with... Our level with, of training already happened. Right. So what you do is, one, it's very simple. That is what we call BSL, basic support system. And it's very easy to do. So we can show you movies, we can show you actual dummies, you can, you can do all that learn. But you know the greatest thing, if you can, if there is a very good data which says, if you have a person who is trained in basic life support, he, within the f 5 or 10 minute vicinity of the collapse, 
then there is over a 60% chance that that person will survive. Okay. If you are right there, there is a 90% chance that you will survive. That is if you know how to do the basic life support till professional help arrives. Now that also is a matter in India if professional help doesn't arrive for two hours, there is no way you can keep somebody alive with BLS. But can you imagine each one of you, if you saved one person's life in your lifetime, you would feel a totally different person in your whole life. So it's worth learning. Right? And many a times, I mean, it's, it's very simple, it's nothing, nothing so, so complicated or gross. Okay? Does that answer your question? I want to ask about the cooking oil for daily cooking. Ah, good question. Okay. So we are saying, if you look at grossly at fat, solid fat is worse than liquid fat as a principle. So butter, margarine, this uh, processed ghee like vanaspati is all terrible. We used to say maybe re re asli ghee is also bad, but now to keep people confused, we now come up with that you can use two spoons per day of asli ghee if you can find it, two teaspoons. Right, but you do, do not add. So that means you will have to substitute your oil consumption. Now, oil consumption ideal is 15 milliliters a day. Okay. Now this is a rule of thumb. It doesn't mean that if you are if you are so active and you want, you have 20 that you're going to die. But if you're for a normal sedentary lifestyle, no more than 15 cc's in cooking, whatever whatever you want to do. So liquid oils, which we call monosaturated oils, are like olive oil, safola, cornola, rice oil, all this stuff, right? Now what we say, mustard oil, so what we recommend today is that you should, every three to six months, rotate the oil. Because each oil will have some toxicity of some variety for some part of your body. And I'll give you the example of mustard oil. Mustard oil is used a lot in Bengal and Kashmir they have the highest incidence of heart block that requiring pacemakers. Why? There is something in mustard oil for by prolonged incessant use that it damages the nerves of your heart. You will never find out why. Similarly, that's why we are saying that there are oils which will have some toxicity so it's better to change cornola, safola, rice oil, whatever you want to do. Because the origin of those oils are from different different vegetables. Okay? You, it's lunch coffee, time. Coffee, coffee, as you see, he put a coffee, I didn't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's good, but I, black coffee, I mean, I used to eat, drink it in, in New York also, but, but it's bad stuff, not so good. Any other questions? So, but one cup of coffee a day or two a day is not bad. Green tea? Green tea good, but what we say is you should not drink more than seven cups of tea. Like I said, everything has some toxicity. But you need to start that slim, you know, not an emaciated look, but that slim look from the very beginning throughout your life. So that's why eat as little of fat as possible because it has each gram has four calories, nine calories, sorry. Fat has nine calories in every gram, so it's huge. Okay. So is it necessary to have nuts along with fruits? Can it be separate in the morning, for example? No, no. If you are, if they don't go in your stomach at the same time, you you can uh, then they will not serve their purpose of slowing down the absorption of sugar. Or you can you eat it with any protein, even cheese, but then cheese is fattening, so. But is usually monopla? I'm sorry? Is monopla is better than kishmish? I mean, the almonds are set up, yes. Yeah. And the monopla factor, the monopla is like kishmish. That big thing. I think it's healthy, but kishmish itself is very rich in sugar. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you know you're going to have a healthy lunch after this. Thank you, sir. It was really an honor to have you here. We are all, I think, all feeling healthy. We also are reassured if something happens, 
we'll make sure that. No, no, you but know, you know, you you said they'll eat healthy. So I I don't believe that. But you know what happens? I'll tell you what my dilemma is in life. So you're what the lecture I've just given you.